All right, I have absolutely no idea what he said about me because I couldn't hear it back there, so uh, I hope it was good. It was good? Yeah. You sure? Okay. So I'm here to talk to you about big data in 1955, obviously very relevant to today, 57 years ago. Um, when Ed and Kay asked me to speak here, they said, could you do something about you know, Britain or United Kingdom? Because we need something about you know, the UK, because we're in the UK. You know, and some Alan Turing as well, throw in some of that. Uh, some Charles Babbage, you know, throwing a bit of Charles Babbage. Uh, some big data, and I was like, oh, this is like, you know, how am I going to do this? And you can mention Cloudflare where you work as well. So, wow, okay, um, how do I put all those things together? You know, there's a bit of the history of computing. And it made me wonder, though, about something, which is, what is this big data thing? And what you really think about with big data is it's actually a moving target. What is big data today was, you know, in 10 years will be tiny, right? And what was big data a few years ago now is something you can do on your mobile phone. And on Wikipedia, there's this definition of big data, which is, you know, it's a collection of data sets so large and complex that you can't do it with the tools you have at hand. And I would add to that the algorithms you have at hand as well. And here's the bit where I mentioned Cloudflare. Uh, we generate 15 gigabytes of log files every minute uh, in 23 locations around the world. And so we're generating many petabytes of log files per year. It's fairly easy to store them, but analyzing them is not. Now, I'm imagining that in 10 years' time, people will go, ha, 15 gigabytes a minute. Well, obviously, you can do that on your mobile. You know, what are you worrying about? Um, but today, that's, that's fairly big data. And often, when we come about addressing big data, what you end up doing is some sort of partitioning of the data. I mean, at Cloudflare, we've partitioned it across the world into these 23 locations, and we do distributed computation on it. Um, you also end up dealing with very slow storage media, right? One of the key things about big data is you can't get it all in memory. So as much as you'd like to say, I'd like to get my two petabytes of log files in RAM, um, you can't, although there are some projects like RAM Cloud which are trying to do that. And of course, you end up with tons and tons of storage. And it turns out that these things are time invariant when you think about big data. They have always been true, and I think they always will be true. It's just that there's this moving target. You know, it's a bit like Han Solo in his, when, he's asked, when he's told by Luke that he's going to have this incredible reward, and he says, I can imagine quite a bit. Well, the quite a bit he's imagining goes up over time, right? You can, there's more and more data. And it's just a question of, it's a function of the machines you have available. And that was just as true in 1955. Now, why am, why am I interested in 1955? Well, in 1955, there were about 250 uh, computers in the world. There are probably 250 computers in this room right now. Um, one of these was a business computer that was actually in use. Uh, that was the Lions Electronic Office uh, in West London. This is a picture of one bit of it. Of course, like all computers of the period, it was absolutely gigantic. Uh, but it was the first business computer. It was built by Lions. Lions was, at the time, a very large company supplying a huge amount of tea and running tea shops throughout the UK. And it seems a bit weird that you know, the first business computer would be built by these guys, but they had a massive supply chain problem to deal with. They had to make all these cakes in London, distribute them around all over the country. There was varying demand across the country for the sorts of things they wanted. They had to blend tea. You imagine it was a very, very big business. And so the solution was to build a computer. They had seen some of the early reports about computing and thought, that's what we'll do. And they built themselves this thing. Now, it was absolutely cutting edge. It ran at, ran at 500 hertz. Um, it had 2K words of RAM, a RAM in this case being mercury delay lines, i.e., baths of mercury into which you, basically what you do to store stuff in them is you send a sound wave, you make the mercury wobble, it hits the other end, it bounces back and you read it back again. So it's just like RAM, it has to be refreshed constantly and if you send enough of these waves down, you can actually store some bits. And these things are huge, right? Mercury is very heavy and so they had this gigantic two killer words, 35 bit words of RAM and they had five registers. I mean, for a machine at the time, that was pretty going for it. They had um, you know, five actual registers they could do things. And they had multiple independent I.O. So they could be reading and printing at the same time. Again, this was a very, very advanced machine for the time. And they had some really fast punch card readers and printers. And this is actually a, a, one of their punch cards, which is, was available on eBay not very long ago. So everything's on punch cards. So the, so the primary storage is mercury delay lines. The secondary storage is punch cards. So 
Mercury delay lines are the RAM, punch cards are the hard drive. Um, so then, you know, what do you do if you've got a machine like this? Well, you're running it in the day for whatever business tasks you're doing, and you decide, well, we'll rent out computing power to people. And so they actually had this business of renting out computing power, and of course, some of those jobs were big data jobs. One of them was a government mandate came down, which is that British Rail, which was the nationalized rail company, had to calculate the distance between every single railway station in Britain across the existing network. Uh, and it had to do this because it was going to charge for freight based on the actual distance across the network. So one of the first big data problems was a graph problem, right? So it's like a, this is a social graph here, it's a train graph, and you had to figure this out. And, um, you know, there were about 5,500 stations at the time, this is pre the uh, destruction of British Rail, and so all over, the, all over Great Britain. And of course, this is trivial, right? You do Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, which everyone who has done anything with graphs will know about, or you do the floyd Warshall algorithm, which gives you the whole lot in one go. You know, I mean, 5,500 stations, you do this on a machine today, it's pretty trivial. Um, first of all, you have to get your data in. This is always a problem in big data. How do you get your data in? Where is it coming from? Uh, the, first of all, you've got a map. British Rail gave them a map. This is actually, uh, each, this is made up of A2 sheets of paper, um, six of them. So this is a gigantic map, and all of the, you know, who, what's connected to what. So you go off, you put that on punch cards, 5,500, you know, which stations connect to it. Now, already, you've got more data than will fit in RAM, because... You've only got 2K of RAM. You can't even name the stations in RAM, let alone the connections between them. Anyway, you get the source data, and then there are just a few problems. So the first problem is uh, 5,500 stations, there's, there's, almost, there's 12 million pairs of stations. Right? So if you imagine any pairs of stations across this thing. And you've only got 2K of RAM. And it has to include your program as well. Uh, so you, you really have a big day. This is, this is why I say this is just like today. This is the equivalent today of taking a bunch of nice machines you have today and trying to do petabytes of computation on it. Today it looks ridiculous, but they were facing the same problems. Um, the next problem was, you know, secondary storage punch cards is slow, right? You want to do everything in RAM if you can, or in this case Mercury, but same thing. Um, oh, Dijkstra's algorithm hasn't been invented yet. Uh, it won't be published until four years later, and the floyd Warshall algorithm of seven years later. So you've got a graph problem, you don't even know it's called a graph yet, and you haven't got any algorithms to deal with it. Um, and, where are my slides going straight? Okay. And also your machine is doing other stuff. So again, typical of big data clusters, someone else is using the damn machine. So what do they do? Well, I was lucky enough to talk to the software engineer who wrote the code to do this, Roger Coleman. Um, he's pretty elderly now although he had a very, very uh, clear recollection of what they did. So the solution was they had to do everything themselves. And I think there's a lot of similarity with what happens with big data today, which is that a lot of it is pioneering things. So first of all, they had to write really tight code, right? They've only got 2K of RAM, so they've got to fit it in memory, and it also has to run fast. And again, when you think about the sorts of algorithms and things we're building today for big data, you know, runtime becomes a problem. Although we've got lots of machines, you still have to worry about how fast can I run this damn thing. Of course, they did everything in assembly language, which I guess most people aren't doing today. Uh, but they did the, everything in assembly language because they didn't have anything else. This, is this started in 1955. Uh, Fortran, Bacchus is thinking about maybe Fortran is going to come along. Uh, there's no basic, there's no C, there's, no, there's just assembly language. And um, you, in order to get this thing right, actually what you do is you wrote your assembly language down you then manually punched it onto punch tape, feed that into a punch tape reader, which creates punch cards for you, and then you load those punch cards into the machine. So you really have to get it right the first time. Um, the second thing you have to do is you have to independently invent Dijkstra's algorithm. So what they did was they sat down, and Roger Colvin over the phone described this to me, how they came up with Dijkstra's algorithm. So they, they basically drew a little bit of the network and they said, well, how are we going to work out this? And step by step, and his description uses different language to the classic descriptions of Dijkstra's algorithm, but he's absolutely going through a visited and unvisited set of stations, working out whether he's got the minimum distance so far, and moving on. And that also gave them, as they were going along, a way to partition up the data, which is they said, actually, we can, it looks like we can stop this computation at any point 
we can calculate up to a certain point and then say, okay, I've got partial results, I'll store them. Now, the only problem is you've got to dump everything to punch cards. So you, they've got maybe an hour a day when they can run the machine because doing other stuff, figuring out where the tea is going to be and how many cakes to make. And so they, they can run these little hour runs and then they dump it out of punch cards. And here's where the storage thing is rather fascinating. Today you think about how many disks do I need. They were having to think about how many punch cards they were going to have to order to have enough cards available to print out the solution. Because each of those punch cards only has a small number of bytes on it. And they've got 12 million pairs of data. So they were literally dealing with roomfuls of punch cards in boxes. Oh, we need the, we need the data for the cr starting in crew and going towards Leicester. Where's that box of punch cards? We'll load it in tonight and do that. And they couldn't fit it all in memory, so they had to partition the data. So how do you partition the data? I'll talk about that. It took them nine months. So nine months of running at about an hour a day to get this thing to run. And presumably a hell of a lot of tea, which they could get for free. Um, this picture, though, here is one of Lyon's coffee houses. These were all tea houses. They were all over, all over the UK. And, of course, they couldn't stop this supply chain thing. That was absolutely vital, that ran. So what did they do? Well, one of these interesting is they noticed, they looked at Scotland, and they noticed a couple of interesting things about Scotland. You see the bar, the green bar at the bottom there? That's the, approximately the Scottish border. There aren't very many rail lines between Scotland and the rest of the UK. So they realized suddenly that they could probably, if they could find these sort of choke points, they could break the UK up into these regions and separately calculate the regions. And then you could put it back together again. And so once they'd realized that, they actually, uh, Roger actually sat down with his map on the floor, a massive thing, drawing on it with a pen, trying to figure out you know, where are these interesting regions? Can you cut it down into something manageable? And the other thing they noticed, if you see the little circle I've drawn there, Junctions are the only things that are interesting in Dijkstra's algorithm. Because if you've got a station that's only that's between two stations and there's no other junction, you can forget it's there, and later on you can compute how far it is from the junctions. So first what they did was they, they projected the whole thing into just the junctions, and then they split it up into seven major regions. And what they were aiming to do was get the thing fit in RAM. So they, got, they broke it up into things that would fit in memory so they could actually do a run. So they were actually able to do Scotland in memory in one go. And it took actually just over an hour to do the computation of the distance between all the junctions in Scotland. That's partly because Scotland actually didn't have a very complex rail network. So they manually divided Britain up into regions. And then they could do, within each region, do Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, and then do it between the junctions, work out the distance to the borders, so these boundaries of the, of the problem. And then once you've done that, you've got all these separate regions, and then you put the regions together. And then once you put the regions together, you do the stations. The stations are the things that are between junctions. So now you can put them back in again and say, oh, you know, so Didcot Parkway is a major junction, and so is Oxford, but between the two, those stations that are there, we can just insert them to get the distances. Uh, and then so they've got the whole thing, 12 and a half million pairs, and they print the whole thing out. They have a very fast line printer with that lovely paper shooting out. They print it out, and they put it in the back of a truck, deliver it to British Rail, and that's the last they heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, no one even said thank you. They was just, this, was, this was the 51st job they did, but this was the, the largest sort of big data job they did. And what's interesting about it, to my mind is essentially everything they were doing is very familiar today. Um, the challenge of the, the, that they faced were very similar. Uh, there's not enough RAM, right? There's not enough mercury to go around to store this damn thing. Um, there's not enough RAM to put this thing in memory. So you're forced to do things to break up the data. Uh, the algorithms just don't exist. Very often today you look at big data things and the algorithm may not exist or it may not, in our, in our sorry, more modern version of it, be parallelizable, right? There may not be a parallel version of it. So now you're thinking, how do I get my algorithm to work? Um, the machine's doing other stuff. You know, it may not be calculating how much T is needed in Leicester, but it is doing other things most of the time. And there's a deadline, right? I mean, this, in this case, there was a government mandate. You have to be able to calculate freight charges by distance by such and such a date. And the only way they could do this was by, by computer. And your secondary storage is slow, right? I mean, punch cards 
Not only have you got to print the damn things and read them in, but you've got to go and get somebody to go find them in the room where you've stored them. So you know, when you think about your disks, access time not being that great, punch cards are really slow. What I think is interesting about the message of this is that it tells you that you've all got full employment for a long time. <laughs> right? Because big data was a problem in 1955. It's a problem today. It's just a question of what am I trying to compute versus the hardware that I've got to compute it on. And so whether your machine has got, you know, runs at 500 hertz and has got 2K of RAM or runs at many gigahertz uh, and has a, has a large amount of RAM, you face the same problems. The only real difference is that there were 250 machines in the world in 1955. You could easily have 250 machines in your cluster today. That's really the fundamental difference that's happened is that, is that parallelization. To finish, I'd just like to thank the three people who are important about this. Roger Coleman, who worked on this job 051, as it was called, outside job 51, uh, for going through it with me. The, the diagram on, on your right there is a hand-drawn, his hand-drawn recollection of inventing Dijkstra's algorithm. He, when I asked him about it, said, well, I'll just sort of sketch one for you. Imagine, you know, you've got this little bit of rail network, and this is how you do it, and here's how the steps work out. Um, funnily enough, he, after that, worked on many, many other jobs and then went off into a career in a different way. And when I said to him, well, that's Dijkstra's algorithm, he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and so these people had independently worked on these things. There was, they were not publishing it. They were just doing their job. And I think in many cases, when you think about big data that you're doing today, you're just getting on with stuff, right? You may not realize that the thing you're inventing is interesting. So it's worth open sourcing things, publishing things, or at least telling somebody about a problem you've solved, because you may discover that you know, you've accidentally invented Dijkstra's algorithm or something else. Um, the other person to thank is Tim Breening Jackson, who, uh, like me, is a bit of a nerd. In his case, he's very much a railways nerd. And he came to this by looking at uh, British Rail. And he wrote a research paper, Leo One and the BR Job, which I know all of you will want. And uh, I will send you all a PDF of it, because you'll be fascinated to read the details of British Rail. And if you're interested in Leo, the first business computer, Georgina Ferry's book, A Computer Called Leo, is very, very interesting because it talks about the construction of a machine at a time when there were hardly any machines. When that machine was invented, it was started in the early 50s. There were truly very few machines in the world. And the people at that business were very far thinking to say, the solution to our problem is a computer. And so again, when you think about your big data things, when you think about the problems you're solving, there's a lot of foresight going into, these are the things we can do if we have this, in our case, if I had a thousand machines, what could I solve? This is very similar to what they were doing in 1951 when they started it, which was to say, hmm, I think a machine could actually do this calculation of T for us, or we could change everything. And I commend you to read Georgina Ferry's book, because it's wonderful. Thank you very much.